It doesn't seem all that long back that Rare, one of the most celebrated software houses in the whole world, released a big collection of their games for the Xbox One, with a whole ton of classic games from across their whole history. A few of the best from the shed loads of NES titles they made, some from their SNES and N64 glory days, a selection from their later years under Microsoft. It was well received, even though thanks to licenses and what have you it was obviously incomplete. But there were a few titles that made people scratch their heads a little bit, those being the ones from where it all began on the ZX Spectrum, when where weren't even where. Perhaps these games need to be put in a bit of a context, because hey, if there's one thing that I could say as an example of just how influential the little machine was, it's that it gave where to the world, in the form of one of the best loved little software houses of the early 1980s, Ultimate Play the Game. All that came after wouldn't have existed without it. And so this is the story of those glorious years from 1982 to 1988, when Ultimates were, for a good chunk of that, at the top of the Spectrum world. As most people know, Rare, and indeed Ultimate, were controlled by Tim and Chris, the Stamper Brothers. Such was the case right up until a few years ago when they finally left the company. They first cut their teeth in the world of arcades. It's not known exactly what they worked on, although Gyrus by Konami is often cited as a title that they contributed a lot to. And then they decided to go back home and work on the Spectrum. Why? Well, why not, I suppose? There simply comes a point when you're tired of working for other people. The Stampers decided to strike it out on their own, and formed a company called Ashby Computers and Graphics with the help of John Lathbury and Carol Ward. Unlike a lot of other companies we've covered that were centred in London, Manchester and what have you, ACG based themselves in the picturesque countryside of Ashby de la Zouch in Leicestershire. The company would publicly trade under the name of Ultimate Play the Game, and throughout almost its whole existence the core of the team largely consisted of these four people. Even though they hired more it was, and remained a very small operation. Tim and Chris weren't exactly sure how things were going to pan out at first. Their experience in the arcade world was an advantage, but how could that transfer to creating games in, at the time, just 16 kilobytes of memory? We weren't even at 48k yet. It wasn't exactly a surefire thing, and the ACG name would be used to distribute arcade conversion kits, just as a way to make quick money. However, that would soon fall by the wayside, because Ultimate's first title so happened to be one of the most successful in the history of the Spectrum computer. It was 1983's Jetpack. To better understand these games, you really do need that context more than anything else if you're not already familiar. This was the sort of thing that passed as a good arcade-style experience on the Specky back then. Not usually all that impressive. Short of the odd bit of genius here and there, the specy market was inundated with rip-offs like everywhere else, and usually with amusingly silly names. They were quick and easy, and a lot of them weren't exactly much good, but they were cheap. Jetpack, however, is an altogether different matter. It's an arcade-style game that doesn't rip off anything. There is a composite of different mechanics from other games, you can see asteroids in the flying, joust in the construction, there's a good chunk of Lunar Lander, but Jetpack is its own game, undoubtedly. It moves smoothly in a way that your average basic coded ripoff does not, as an arcade game should, and it's not too long before it gets fast and frenetic. Jetpack was one of the first, if not the first title to pull this sort of thing off, and it did it in just 16 kilobytes, up to the standard of an arcade game in just about every area except presentation, an undisputed classic that still feels good to play now. Ultimate's first title would make them their first million quit, it sold 300,000 copies. No mean feat when you consider that at the time, there were just a million ZX Spectrum owners. And it wouldn't be long before they followed it up with others. Pust, an actually quite pretty game where you have to stop bugs from destroying your plant before it blossoms by killing them with the correct spray, was another arcade style smashing 16 kilobytes, and was again hugely popular. 
It's not usually regarded as one of their best titles today, but it's one that has a special place in my heart as one of my favourite specy games growing up. So there you go. Ultimate 16K1 finished with Trans Am, a rather odd post-apocalyptic driving game where you battle with other cars across America, and the absolutely maddening Cookie, a game where you desperately try to push ingredients into a mixing bowl while chased by dastardly screws and fish bones and what have you. Another brilliant game, but the difficulty level is legendary, even on a computer that's known for stupidly tough games. And with that, Ultimate left 16K behind. It was time to head into the big old 48k market. Ultimate is a quick story, with not all that many games compared to something like Ocean, but it's one that's basically all gold. Near enough every game they made was a hit, it's just that some were bigger than others. With 48k to play with now, they immediately produced another massive smash. Here's Lunar Jetman, the 1983 sequel to Jetpack. Yes, we're still in 1983, and Ultimate were producing these games at a staggering pace. Lunar Jetman is a totally different game to Jetpack, where you have to somehow take a bomb and drop it off at an enemy base while being attacked from every conceivable angle. You are safe inside your moon rover, but it can't travel if the ground isn't smooth, so at some point you'll have to leave, usually to try and get a girder in place. On the surface, you can die in seconds, over and over and over. Oh, and the base will occasionally try to destroy your rover with a missile. And the controls are based in anti-gravity. Lunar Jetman is even harder than Cookie somehow, and one of the toughest games ever made for the Spectrum. Obviously that means I'm terrible at it, and I've never managed to get to the alien base even once. It's still stunning for 1983 of course, there's so many enemies, so much speed, even the ability to teleport, and so many things you have to do. How many Spectrum games do you know that require three buttons? This one does. But like so many of Ultimate's games, it's ridiculously addictive and you'll happily spend an age bashing your head against the wall. They are as close as the specy could get, in 1983, to a pure arcade experience, and once again the game sold hundreds of thousands of copies. Lunar Jetman is also famous for one particular screenshot, sent in by a reader of Crash Magazine, of the Moon Rover pulling a trailer about causing people to wonder if you could do that in the game and looking for ways in which you could. Of course it didn't exist, but it was wildly rumoured, especially thanks to that little shit friend you had in school whose dad worked for Ultimate, and you had to do this, and this, and then that, and then blah blah blah. Yep, it was the original playable Goro in Mortal Kombat. Is that enough smash hits for now? <laughs> no. Ultimate's next game is one of the most famous ever released for the computer, the almighty Attic Attack. Now this I am better at. It's a rather funny and very fast paced game where you rush around a haunted castle's labyrinth looking for pieces of a golden key while killing loads and loads of baddies. It's got items that are totally useless, tons of different enemies, gravestones marking where you died, and even boss fights, and it's that little bit different every time you play. An absolutely staggering game on release, Attic Attack is, in all honesty, probably my favourite Ultimate Play the Game... Uh, game, and it made Ultimate another cool million pounds. TV producer Tim Child later confirmed in an interview that Attic Attack was the game that originally provided inspiration for the cult classic children's game show, Nightmare. The game was Ultimate's third consecutive number one, and they were the absolute darlings of the press, the kins of the whole field. And hey, it might just be a good time to chat about the press a little. One thing that has usually been noted about Rare, to a fault usually, is that they have always been quite aloof, they are famously hard to get hold of. 
You wouldn't ever find the stampers mugging in the press, or even, for the most part, hyping their own games. As it goes, this isn't something that gradually developed over time. Ultimate were exactly the same. Unlike virtually every other big shot in the days of the bedroom coda boom, aside from their very early days, Ultimate almost never gave interviews. Why? Well, in the words of Tim Stamper, it was never really a conscious decision. As mentioned previously, the team at Ultimate were very small, and they were always working on something, whether it was a specy game or another secret project or experiment. They simply didn't have time for interviews. They soon twigged on also that their lack of contact with the outside world actually provided them with a certain mystique and aura, and so they just went with it. It wasn't as though they had anything against the press, they just felt that their time was better spent working on games. And at the very least, it also means that the negative aspects of being visible in the press never applied to Ultimate, or Rare as they were before Microsoft. No, you wouldn't find Rare sweetening up Max for positive scores, or denying access to people who gave negative scores. A game gets released, and it's out there for fair judgement. If people love it, then great. If they don't, then hey-ho, fair play, on to the next one. The business model that the company took on post-Ultimate also precluded it somewhat. And it should also be noted that this aloofness didn't extend to the company's fans, right into the team and you'll happily get a response and probably a goodie bag into the bargain. They prided themselves on answering every piece of fan mail. It's just that in their eyes, there was only so much they could do with the relatively tiny team they had. So, finally we're in 1984, with Ultimate coming off one of the best first years in any software house's history. They'd released six games, all of which were hits, and half of which sold hundreds of thousands of copies apiece. Because Ultimate were doing both the developing and the publishing, thanks to the existence of Centersoft, the country's largest computer game distributor, more on that when we eventually cover US Gold, they didn't release as many games as other software houses, but the release of an Ultimate game was starting to become something of an event just to see what they'd come up with next. Ultimate would only release four games in 1984, three of which would feature the adventures of the same character. As Jetman rested his boosters for a little while, Ultimate would introduce Saberman for a set of adventures into mysterious places. And here's his first game, Saberwolf. It's sort of similar to Attic Attack in many ways, in that you move about an overhead map and have to find pieces of an artefact in order to complete the game, but it's much faster paced and a lot harder. I mean, you just have a meagre sword to defend yourself with, and you can only attack left and right. You can't just blast through the game like you could with Attic Attack, you've really got to be careful and pick your moments. You only get used to the game through dying a lot, and I really do mean a lot. So you know, hey, <laughs> it's just like Dark Souls, am I right? It has to be said, it does look pretty great still. The jungle is still really quite atmospheric, especially for a Spectrum game. I prefer Attic Attack to this, but it's still a bloody excellent game. Saberwolf marked a little change in Ultimate's philosophy. Seeing how successful they'd been, and how Ultimate's games were treated as the premier products on the market, they did something to test that out a bit. They doubled their prices, with Saberwolf costing a tenner in the shops and coming in a big old plain box. Another reason for the price hike was, ostensibly, to combat piracy. Ultimate's reasoning that if you'd paid so much money for this game, you wouldn't necessarily want to let your friends copy it for free, even though there was no on-tape protection to speak of. How successful this was is debatable, but the rise in price didn't impact the game's success, and Saberwolf was yet another smash hit. Some did question the game's general similarity to Attic Attack, but aside from the viewpoint and general main aim, they're really quite different in how they feel and play. The second Saberman game was a 2D platformer, Underworld. This is an odd one where Saberman must travel down into the murky depths in order to conquer the ultimate evil. It's a huge game with nearly 600 screens, compared to Saberwolf's 250 or so, 
and it has a great reputation, although I have to be honest and say that it's not a favourite of mine. I find the way the game handles jumping to be absolutely maddening. While enemies themselves don't kill you, it's real easy for them to knock you off a ledge, and falling more than one screen does kill you, over and over. It's still different in many ways, Saberman automatically jumps to the nearest platform he can, he can hand off ceilings, it's certainly different from other Spectrum platformers and there's a hell of a lot to explore to be sure. A brilliantly made game, but not really my cup of tea. So if there's one general theme you can grasp from all the games we've looked at so far, it's that, yeah, Ultimate made very hard games indeed. You'd certainly spend an age on any of them because of that. The Spectrum is full of hard games generally, but these are a level beyond, and because of that I can understand why such games could be hard to get into now, as much as they are all regarded as Monster Computer's best. If you are unfamiliar with these games, I would suggest starting off with Attic Attack and going from there. It's probably the most welcoming. I make this digression because Ultimate were now at a point where difficulty and arcade stylings would become less of a concern. The third Saberman game is by some distance, even in a library filled with classics, Ultimate's greatest, most praised and influential game. And for all the advances that Ultimate had made to date, it has to be said that none of them would compare with this one. Near the end of 1984, Ultimate released Night Law. Night Law's level of innovation does get overstated sometimes, of course. I've heard people claim that it was the first isometric 3D game ever, which is demonstrably untrue. But considering the relative simplicity of isometric drawing and how it gives a strong, although not real, 3D effect, it's surprising that by this point there was only Gottlieb's Qbert, Sega's Zaxxon, and indeed Sandy White's brilliant and utterly hilarious ant attack on the spectrum that were taking advantage of it. Ant Attack is a nice comparison to Night Law, as you can see the things they do differently. This was a very popular game, but well, here's Night Law, and that was the difference. The evolution from something like Ant Attack, where you have this fully detailed setting, the big blocks, the fact that your character can disappear behind these blocks, enemies and the like, no clash, no nothing, everything is utterly smooth thanks to some very clever image masking. Ultimate would give this engine a name, Filmation, and they would use it as a pretty big marketing tool going forward. Night Law is, graphically speaking, the most jaw-dropping game released in the history of the computer. Yes, some other games would go on to look even better, but nothing actually wowed a crowd like Night Law did. The game itself is a puzzle-based adventure where Saberman has to visit a wizard who wants eight objects. You retrieve an object, put it in the cauldron, and onto the next one. You have 40 days and 40 nights to do this, and at night Saberman, in one of the most awesome sequences on the Specky, turns into a werewolf. You have no attacks, but you can jump and hold three items at once. The puzzling mostly consists of intricate jumping puzzles, timing based stuff, avoiding monsters and the like, as well as clever use of other items to get to hard to reach spots. The sound probably represents some of the best and most atmospheric use of the 48k beeper, as it's just all over the place when the monsters are around. The game's still got something, it really has. And of course it was highly influential because suddenly everyone wanted to do an isometric puzzle platformer. There's Ocean's Batman and Head Over Heels, Nosferatu the Vampire, Suivo's World, Movie… there's a lot, all made possible by Night Law. Although these days the most famous example of the genre is probably the classic NES game Solstice, which could almost be seen as a remake of Night Law. At least I think that's pretty much one of the only times that the genre actually managed to come to America. The most ridiculous thing about all of this? By the time Ultimate released Saberwolf, Night Law was already finished, and so was Underworld. They laid out their 1984 to the letter, 
Machine Sable Wolf out first, because even though Night Law was so far beyond most anything else on the spectrum, Sable Wolf just wouldn't have sold in its wake. Near the end of their short life, Specky Hotshots Imagine constantly hyped up their mega game Bandersnatch as something else, but by the time of the company's implosion it wasn't even close to done. This low? This is what a mega game truly looks like, and Ultimate sat on it for close to a year. You can't really get a bigger example of just how different they were to everyone else than that, and they'd managed to wow the crowds once again. Just what else could they actually do? Ultimate entered 1985 as the top developers on the spectrum, undoubtedly, and they hit the ground running. Alien 8 was the next game to feature the isometric filmation engine at work, albeit with a few little tweaks here and there that gave the backgrounds and blocks a bit more variety, there was more variety in the puzzles, and once again it was very well received. Apparently set in the same universe, although obviously not the same time as Night Law, and featuring a fairly similar objective to that game, people did again question Ultimate releasing a very similar title to the last one, and they perhaps had a bit more grounding on this than they'd had previously with comparisons between Attic Attack and Sabre Wolf. Still, the game was very well loved and a roaring success, it's certainly regarded as equal to Night Law in Ultimate's canon. It was also half finished by the time Ultimate released Sabre Wolf, which just shows how much work they were doing at the time. There were little stabs at expansion, including a bunch of games for the other big computer. Ultimate C64 games, however, were a bit of a mixed bag. They mostly consisted of the Sir Arthur Pendragon series, another bunch of isometric games, starting with the staff of Carnaf in 1984. Critics were quite mixed on these, usually saying that while the games looked great and all that, they just weren't very interesting and there really wasn't a whole lot of sound. It was also known that the Stampers weren't working on these 64 games, which probably made the criticism even harsher if anything, although that was hardly fair to brothers Dave and Bob Thomas who created the games. And of course, being seen as a Spectrum developer in general probably couldn't have helped when coming into C64 territory. There were four Pendragon games in all, and by the time of the fourth one, Dragon's Skull in 1985, the magazines were quite happy to see the back of him. And honestly, I can't really blame them. The stuff of Karnath is okay, but the other three Pendragon games, um, honestly, they're quite bad, especially Black Witch. They're nowhere near Ultimate's usual standard on the spectrum. Ultimate C64 Adventures also included Imhotep, a very straightforward Egyptian based shoot 'em up designed by Manuel Caballero, and another game by the Thomas Brothers called Outlaws, which is kind of like their Pendragon games, only in the Wild West. The game was absolutely slated and is usually regarded as Ultimate's worst reviewed game. And quite rightly so, because frankly, Outlaws is terrible. Easily the worst game we'll see in this video. I guess it all goes to show that the main focus for Ultimate was still very much on the spectrum. Whatever they did on the C64 wasn't going to change that, and in any case, the Stampers themselves never designed a game with the C64 in mind. And so they continued to enhance this almighty Filmation engine, introducing Filmation 2 with the release of Nightshade in 1985. The main difference? Gone are flip screens. Filmation 2 now features scrolling backgrounds. There's quite a bit of action in Nightshade 2, as you have various weapons to shoot monsters with. However, much like in Pust, you have to shoot the monsters with the white weapon, or face grave consequences. It's certainly a decent enough evolution on what Night Law and Alien 8 had popularised, in some ways. However, something was different. The reviews for Nightshade weren't actually all that good. People were now getting a bit frustrated. They didn't see Nightshade as much of a step forward from Night Law, which is fair because it wasn't really. The backgrounds and general design just weren't as memorable, it was a lot slower, and the increased action just felt well, a bit less interesting. 
It got a fantastic review from Crash, as just about every Ultimate game ever did, but other mags were a lot cooler on it. The second and final game to use the Filmation 2 engine, Gunfright, did get a slightly better reception, mainly because Gunfright, a Wild West game, dropped any puzzling and instead delivered a straight isometric and really quite fun action game that was, for the most part, pretty solid. You go around a big town, you avoid innocence, you shoot bad guys, you ride around on your horse. It felt quite different from the likes of Nightshade in many ways, and it's even got a little shooting gallery section. It's certainly another Ultimate game that's very much worth playing, although it's not quite as famous as their earlier hits. And, well, believe it or not, but we're almost at the end of this story. With the release of their Filmation games, it was quite clear to the Stampers that they'd pushed the Spectrum as far as they could. The lukewarm reception to Nightshade also felt as if the press was starting to call on them a bit, and while they could stick with the Specky, they didn't have much else to give there. There was no longer any room for innovation, which was basically all that the Stampers had done since arriving on the computer. They'd seen the fates of companies like Imagine, and didn't want to push things too far. And so, at the end of 1985, the Stampers sold up. They'd always had a good relationship with Centersoft, the biggest distributor of computer games in the UK, and that continued as Centersoft went into the publishing business and evolved into US Gold. Indeed, US Gold had published Gunfright. A move to purchase Ultimate by US Gold had long been rumoured, and indeed, at the end of 1985, it happened. The last couple of years of Ultimate, without the Stampers, are quite murky with not many games of note. Pentagram from 1986, which was either the last Ultimate game by the Stampers, or made by a US Gold team, <laughs> nobody actually remembers, was the last title to feature the Filmation engine, and also the fourth Saberman game. Reviews for it were rather lukewarm, to say the least, and uh, to be honest, widely so. It's no different from Night Law. There's Cyber One, an arcade shooter with frosty controls that has a touch of the Solar Jetmans about it. Martianoids, which is like an isometric, fast-paced tower defence game but with non unplayable controls. And Bubbler, which is a Marble Madness style game with even worse controls than Martianoids, that's also arguably the worst game Ultimate ever released. Not exactly a good selection. And that was it. The most interesting game from the US Gold years was the one that never came out, Miramari, which was hyped up at the end of Night Law. According to legend, the game was finished, but the Stampers purposefully kept it away from US Gold when they sold the company off, annoyed that US Gold didn't care to do much with Ultimate beyond releasing their back catalogue at a budget price. Mirimari was going to be the last Saberman title, and it would be another Filmation game much like Night Law, apparently. The legend wasn't quite true. Rare would later explain that Mirimari was set to be a top-down game a la Saberwolf, and by the time US Gold took over the company, the game was only half finished with completed design, but barely any coding done. And so, the Stampers just disappeared from the scene completely. They went into hibernation, and no one heard a pipsqueak out of them. For a couple of years, anyways. What happened next is still murky, and in all honesty, the main source for the whole thing is the Stampers themselves, so, yeah, some things might be exaggerated. But no matter what, something had to happen in order for what was once Ultimate to become one of the biggest games developers in the world. It's known that at some point, or perhaps even as early as 1983, the Stampers acquired a Famicom, probably using the contacts they'd established from working in the arcade business. They had no support from Nintendo, and certainly no dev manuals, but they started working on it, experimenting, figuring out how you programmed games for it. As time drew on, working on the Famicom was ever more enticing. The Stampers felt that they'd reached the Spectrum's limit in every possible area, including sales. The computer was only hugely popular in the UK, after all. 
They saw that Worldwide the Famicom was potentially the next big thing, and they were happy with the cartridge format as it put a stop to the casual piracy they'd always struggled with on the Spectrum. If there's one thing you can figure out about Ultimate, it's that they were good at the long term stuff that the majority of companies I've looked at don't usually excel at. They worked on the Famicom for years without any support, learning the system off by heart, so that they would be able to get in on the ground floor when it broke worldwide. However, it still wasn't going to be that easy, because, after all, the Famicom breaking worldwide hadn't happened yet, Nintendo controlled the publishing for their games, and they were notoriously tough to deal with. But the Stampers got a foot in the door through a man named Joel Hochberg, who they'd known since the arcade days, and who'd worked with Nintendo. Hochberg got the Stampers a meeting with Minoru Arakawa, at which point the Stampers showed off their work, and that was enough for Nintendo to sign them up as the first Nintendo affiliated company working outside of Japan. At which point, Hochberg and the Stampers officially formed Rare in 1985, a separate entity from Ultimate. They detonated their relatives, set up operations in a very secretive farmhouse in Twycross, and just worked and worked and worked. In 1987, Rare started to release games for the NES and, well, they basically wouldn't stop. The model changed to one where they could pump games out at an astonishing speed, as well as continuing to publish games by other, smaller dev teams. A team called Zippo Games, for example, which were eventually bought, were actually the ones responsible for the popular Wizards and Warriors series. Rare were staggeringly prolific. Not all the games were good, I mean, far from it, but a good chunk of them were pretty damn memorable. And, well, the rest is basically history. The story of Ultimate as a label finally comes to an end in 1988, when Ware bought back the rights to the company and all of its properties from US Gold. The label itself was never used again, and the old games largely went into a happy retirement, although Ware have seen fit to give life to a couple of old Ultimate games now and then. Inarguably, the most famous of these is So the Jetman on the NES, the long awaited third entry in the Jetpack series. An ultra hard game that's actually also a little bit like the US Gold era title Cyber One in that it's quite frosty. A fairly well remembered game, and in the classic tradition of Ultimate, <laughs> yeah, it's brutal. Savage. The definition of Nintendo hard. While it's not directly related to any Ultimate game, I've always thought that Wizards and Warriors was certainly highly influenced by Ultimate's games, in particular anything from the Saberman series. It's quite a bit like Underworld, only for me, a hell of a lot better. In fact, I would say that Wizards and Warriors is honestly one of my favourite games for the NES, it's bloody brilliant. Saberwolf was revived in 2004 in the form of this quite cutesy platformer for the Game Boy Advance. It almost looks as though it could be good, but then you play it and it's just really freaking boring. You wish it was kind of just a straight remake. And while we're on Sable Wolf, we mustn't forget that one of the characters in Rare's Killer Instinct series of fighting games is called Sable Wolf. And naturally, he's a hulking great werewolf. And finally, Jetpack received a modern update for Xbox Live Arcade in 2007 with Jetpack Refueled a very faithful take on Ultimate's first ever game, but with way souped up graphics. In 2015, Ware released their replay compilation for the Xbox One, which included seven classics from the Ultimate days, Jetpack, Lunar Jetman, Attic Attack, Sable Wolf, Underworld, Night Law and Gunfight, as well as Solar Jetman and the 2007 Jetpack remake. Unfortunately, the Stampers decided to leave Ware behind in 2007, and were not interviewed for the game's bonus features. They, or rather Tim, tend to give interviews a little bit more these days, but they are still very elusive when it comes to the question of exactly what they're working on right now. They're on the board for a mobile games company that's won by Tim's son Joe, and they're not involved in any way with Platonic Games and their successful Banjo-Kazooie-esque Kickstarter, Ukulele. And that's about it. Their reputation here in the UK remains, quite rightly so, legendary. The Ultimate story then is somewhat different from a fair few of the ones I've covered already. It is, after all, undoubtedly a good ending. It's a real quick story too. It's amazing to think that basically the whole story occurred in the space of just two years, from the release of Jetpack to US Gold's takeover, during which time almost every game they released was a definitive title for the ZX Spectrum. 
As soon as they saw that the winds were changing, they decided to do what virtually no one else did at the time. They quit while they were still ahead, and used the money that they'd made to form another company that would survive and be one of the most powerful and influential games companies in the entire world for years to come. And they did it all while still remaining somewhat aloof and disconnected from the world of gaming at large. It's odd that one of the defining characteristics of Ultimate was that they didn't play the game, and largely that added an allure to them that worked out in their favour, allowing them to quietly reshape and regenerate themselves into something altogether different. Some would still say that they never quite managed to top these days though. I mean, I'd probably disagree with that, but few companies managed to do so much in such a short space of time and indeed, eventually just flat out outgrow the spectrum until these guys came along. Bye for now. Thanks for watching another glorious retrospective on the history of Ultimate Play the Game, another chapter in the Spectrum 8-bit microcomputer history. As usual, if you liked this video, please consider subscribing, and also consider following me on my Facebook and Twitter, or even supporting me on Patreon. Now, as usual, I have to give very special thanks to the most awesome people, Taylor Armand, Lee Norris, and Grayfern Blackpool. Thank you so much for, as usual, being utterly awesome. And I also have to give thanks to the following also very awesome people. Mark Johnston, Mark Johnson, Tim Lintz, Robert Kelly, Olaf Albine, Peter Sidon, Edge Reader, Russell Hugo, Gerard Morris, John Ezell, Dave Parkinson, Ninth Demon, Mike Siegler, L. O'Brien, Kit Leary, Scott Coulter, Mark Brooks, Ludwig Holmstrom, Mike Spooner, Nicole Ketchum, Scott Mitten, Graham Kamek, and Paolo Leary. And thank you to all the other people who you see listed for supporting me in my work. I cannot tell you just how much it means. As usual, I shall be back next Monday when we shall be rising from our grave for another, hopefully, awesome video. God, I keep saying awesome so much, it, I really need to get a new vocabulary, I think. Anyway, I shall see you then, but as ever, until then, wherever you are, whoever you be, have a good one, and take care. Bye for now.